Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Will Snyder. I'm a sales and charter broker with 26 North Yachts. Our special guest today is Graham Lord, who's the founder and president of Fairport Yacht Services. Fairport is a value partner to over 40 yachts worldwide, um, assisting clients out of offices in Fort Lauderdale, Palm Beach, and Guernsey, which is one of the Channel Islands off the coast of France. One of the critical services that Fairport provides is ensuring vessel compliance with the nearly 40 international conventions, 800 codes, and seemingly infinite number of acronyms that govern safety, security, and pollution at sea. They also assist with crew administration, things like payroll and crew visas, and they're instrumental when it comes to financial administration, technical support, and the documentation of a vessel. One really interesting fact about Fairport is that they're certified in the passenger yacht code. Essentially, this code offers a pathway for large yachts to carry more than 12 charter guests uh, and up to 36 passengers plus crew. As I mentioned, leading the team at Fairport is Graham Lord. He was born and raised in Zimbabwe and first joined the industry in 1994 as the second engineer on a 155 foot yacht quickly moving his way up to chief engineer. After six years of visiting the most remote places on earth, uh, Graham made the decision in 2000 after the birth of his first son to take a land-based yacht management role, ultimately founding Fairport Yacht Services in 2011. Graham holds a number of prestigious positions within various industry organizations and is incredibly knowledgeable. I can speak from that firsthand. I had the good fortune uh, to be at a sales team meeting uh, not too long ago with Graham where he answered any and every question that we could conceivably throw at him. And to make a long story short, we hope that you all uh, do the same thing this morning using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And so without further ado, here's Mike Carlson, co-founder of 26 North Yachts and Graham Lord. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Good morning, Will. Thanks for, uh, yeah, Graham, it's good to have you here. And yeah, we appreciate the time and going uh, through a little bit about what Fairport offers and kind of what your experiences have been going through uh, COVID-19, as well as what the future looks like for, for the marine and yachting industry. So thanks for, uh, yeah, thanks for being here. Uh, th thank you, Mike, and thank you all for that generous introduction. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to, to be here today, and I look forward to uh, trying to answer some questions and sharing the experiences that we're having out there. Yeah, so I guess to get started talking, you know, I, I think a little bit obviously, you know, the obvious question is like how COVID-19 has impacted the, um, the yachting industry from a management standpoint in handling crew. And maybe if you could talk to a little bit, Graham, about like the crew services that you offer on uh, on managing you know managing crew from an employment standpoint and, and going through that a little bit. Uh, absolutely, Mike. So initially, we had the the knee jerk reaction that you would expect of uh, lay the boat up; it can't be used. And uh, the news was all indicating that this may last for the entire year. That that knee jerk reaction has passed now. Uh, unfortunately, included in that knee jerk reaction is a lot of crew were let go and the, uh, with the idea that the boat would go similar to a 2008 scenario where the boat would be laid up for extended periods with a minimal amount of crew. What we did learn from that experience is that really wasn't an economical decision. Um, the, the maintenance still needed to be done on boats and you were just um, putting it off till a later date when it was almost certainly going to become more expensive. And uh, the crew, in truth, if you work out what uh, they earn, per hour is probably some of the cheapest, most knowledgeable uh, labor that you can get on board the vessel. Uh, we were able to uh, explain to a lot of our clients that um, time is the most precious commodity we all have. And for the first time in all of our lives, uh, we have time on our hands. Uh, and to utilize that time carefully would be a, a, another way to approach this uh, with the idea that once things get moving again, all the maintenance on the vessel would be up to date and the vessel would be able to operate uh, continuously for uh, up to 18 months. And the clients that adopted that, I think are way ahead of the curve now, as we're beginning to see more use become viable, uh, albeit very limited. 
but um, certainly this week, I've been contacted by the majority of our clients saying, I'm ready to use the boat. I'm looking forward to using the boat. Mm -hmm. uh, weather's picking up. Let's, uh, let's go somewhere. Or I'm quite happy to get on the boat and be static at the dock as long as I can use some of the, the uh, water toys, the tenders, the wave runners, the paddle boards, uh, and base off the boat. So um, we've done through the ramp down. Uh, now we're beginning to see a very gradual ramp up. Um, Obviously, the, the management of that of the crew through this has been extremely complicated. Um, the uh, a, a owner of a yacht has a responsibility when they terminate a crew member to get that person back to their home, uh, and uh, the, the change of flights and restrictions, getting people home, has possibly been one of the most challenging things I've ever had to deal with. Uh, Brent, can you talk to a little bit on sort of managing the crew, like what, what you guys offer? And I know, you know, it's, um, I think the last time that you're here in the office and discussing it is, you know, yeah, it's like, can you kind of go through that as far as kind of absolutely. taking it off the owner's hands? Absolutely. I think uh, there's no question in my mind, the most common question I get is about crew employment, um, what the tax liabilities are, especially if you're an American owner. And, and just general liabilities. Uh, traditionally, the crew were employed by the vessel and all the liabilities stood with the owner. Uh, and, and my company would manage that on behalf of the owner, ad administering the payroll, possibly the, the easiest part of it. Uh, mm -hmm. Understanding taxation, especially on a worldwide basis, and withholding taxes as appropriate for each crew member. And then supplying crew agreements and employment agreements that not only satisfied the owner of the boat, but also met the regulations. Crew, crew employment is a heavily regulated sector and it's complicated because of the international nature, nature of our business. Most recently, uh, we've, uh, the industry has been moving towards uh, crew leasing. I'm, I'm completely confident that we're leading that path. Um, having recently established a crew leasing company in Cayman Islands, uh, where the crew are our employees and are leased back to the owner. The owner still enjoys uh, a, an open relationship with the individuals. The only difference is that we're taking on all liabilities and responsibilities for the employment, uh, not just financial, but also uh, the well-being and making sure that uh, they, if there's any disputes or any uh, regulatory pieces that need to be adhered to that they're our responsibility and that we we make sure it's done correctly for the client have you seen a big influx just as far as like crew availability actually here just real quickly a, a question did come up from uh, from chris coleman he says how are you able to maintain the flag state compliance i think this is in regards to if you're to mothball the boat or, or lay some crew off which as you noted is not necessarily the best idea having gone through that in 08 specifically. But so how are you able to maintain the flag state compliance and turn insurance coverage by laying off crew during this time? Carriers require that many requirements be maintained or coverage is not valid. So it's it, like- it, it's, it's been very, very difficult. We really, what we've had to do is lay out a plan uh, for each yacht of how the vessel's gonna be um, maintained, how, how the, the crew that are on board is sufficient to deal with an emergency um, and that plan we've had to submit both to the flag state and to insurance the uh, the flag states manning falls under solace so safety at life at sea so at the dock you your requirements are somewhat limited because technically you're not at sea um, that said um, the there is still uh, rec the crew welfare is still absolutely in place. So uh, we've heard of many cases where crew were laid off and told that that's it, um, find your way, own way home. Uh, these, these are gonna create problems in the future. I, I don't think we've even touched the tip of the iceberg of those problems yet, simply because uh, most of the flag states may have one or two personnel assigned to uh, crew, they call them the shipping master. They may have one or two shipping masters uh, as you can imagine, those in a normal day, they're probably, or the normal month, they're probably dealing with less than 100 disputes. Uh, I know right now, you know, they're dealing with thousands and thousands. Of them. So they're overwhelmed, and, and this will catch up 
but I do think they will catch up with many owners, and I, I think that it's not going to be pleasant. Um, the the insurance companies have been understanding, uh, but again, it's going to get a little more complicated as we move into hurricane season. Um, right. Many of the European uh, underwriters uh, had a bad time through last year's hurricane season, and um, uh, my recommendation, captains, is start putting a lot of thoughts into your hurricane plan. Uh, simply saying that we have a dock and we're going to put out extra lines is not going to cut it. Uh, you, you're going to have to really have an evacuation plan of leaving the area, have an alternative place to go, and uh, have everything on board to perhaps uh, go remote and be on anchor in a safe zone for three or four weeks. So how are you guys, man, is with hurricane season around the corner, what are you guys doing to, you know, in preparation for that, as well as being limited dockage availability, even here in South Florida with fewer boats going to Europe in the Northeast? Yeah, fortunately, within our fleet, most of the yachts are large enough and have enough range to sustain themselves uh, to, to move away from a hurricane. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's in the past, uh, I've, I've been involved in, few major hurricane claims. Uh, in my experience, the big claims are, are boats that stay at the dock and the damage that is sustained is mostly sand damage uh, mo and, and damage from uh, the, uh, the sand from shingles of surrounding houses. Mm -hmm. So you end up with, uh, with complete paint jobs and often complete window replacements on the yachts. Um, the, conversely, the yachts that have made a decision about uh, 10 days before uh, to leave and try to get out of the path. And which is a, it often the first, the first decision isn't the necessarily the correct one. You just make sure you go in the right direction and decide as you go. But getting out of the path has been, has been the most successful. Yeah. And again, I'd recommend to captains plan for that. Plan, plan to be uh, dodging hurricanes for up to three weeks at a time through the summer. What about too, Graham, as far as like with, with owner, the, the, with the boats that you manage too, for owners that want to start using the boat here in the, you know, in the near future, I know you have your sort of pulse on what, uh, you know, what's sort of opening up, whether here in Florida or other areas of the world, where are you seeing places start to, or at least talk about opening up at this point? What, what we're seeing, which is a, somewhat of a, a shift, but I think a positive shift is uh, we have two, two of our clients on board their boats in Miami right now and are quite happy to be static at the dock as long as they can use their, uh, their tenders and their the wave runners, water toys, and, uh, and enjoy, obviously, the, the level of service the crew are able to give. Uh, that's unusual because these boats normally would not be at the dock for more than a couple of hours. Uh, so there's been a, a shift. Uh, I think what, what we have to keep in mind, we're quite blessed down here in South Florida, we've had a fantastic uh, winter and spring. And uh, through isolation, we've all been able to go outdoors and enjoy a bit of warm weather and some fresh air. Many of our clients are coming from cold climates. Um, so the idea of being on board in a safe environment, and maybe we'll touch on that a little bit later, but uh, that uh, just getting out in the sun and being able to enjoy the boat is, is really attractive, even though it is static. Um, we really are keeping our fingers crossed that the Bahamas opens up at the end of the month. Um, is that the, you heard, is that what you're? Yeah. What What are you hearing as far as the Bahamas opening? You know, it's um, trying to get the official word out of there is very difficult. But uh, from what I understand, it's uh, certainly not before the end of the month, but mm. possibly by the middle of next month. However, the Bahamas are going to have a bumper season. They're going to have a, a, a just an unbelievably good season. And I have no doubt that there is financial pressure there. Um, I do believe that there's a way, and we're beginning to see this from some of the uh, other Caribbean islands, that uh, as long as you fly in on a, on a private aircraft, uh, that you would uh, go straight from the airport to the yacht and leave, uh, and then stay on anchor. You really have had no interaction with anybody uh, mm -hmm. from points of entry and then exit. And uh, we're seeing an easing of that down in islands like St. Lucia and uh, Barbados, where um, they're beginning to talk about allowing people to come and go straight to the, the yachts as long as it departs immediately. Uh, and that you would, you would pre-clear um, electronically so the guests would not interact with anybody on the ground when they land and would be collected by a vehicle that's uh, 
rented by the yachts but, and driven by a crew member. So there really is no interaction with any of the, uh, in that, in the residents of the island. Yeah. So that, I'm keeping my fingers crossed that that's where we go because Bahamas could have an unbelievably good season. And are you saying that because there's fewer boats going, you know, I guess, yeah, fewer boats going to Europe and the Northeast? That... Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, I would say of our fleet, um, in a normal year, about uh, 60 to 70 percent of them would be making their preparations to go to Europe. Uh, we're probably down to about 20 to 30 percent of that number right now. Um, and actually, we have two yachts in Europe that are uh, heading this way. Uh, canceling the European season and looking to, to have a Caribbean and uh, uh, US season. Um, mm. I'm, I'm very, very hopeful that uh, New England area starts to open up soon. I think practically, though, we're somewhat fortunate. Uh, that season traditionally only starts around the 4th of July weekend. So mm. we still have another month of breathing space on that. But I also anticipate that um, uh, New England could have an unbelievably good season. Yeah. Uh, so what do you see for uh, dockage availability in New England right now? Most of it's booked. Yeah. Uh, it's, there is going to be a shortage of dockage if, if it opens up. Um, we, we speak uh, through the Marine Industry Association of South Florida, who, by the way, be excellent uh, on sharing knowledge. Um, we speak with Customs Border Patrol once a week. Um, they, as soon as the stay at home uh, is lifted, they, they're willing to start issuing cruising permits same day. Um, mm -hmm. And as you know, for a foreign flag boat, you do need a cruising permit um, and um, they, will, they will be able to go up to New England and start enjoying that, that season too. Mm -hmm. And what, Grams, kind of going through all this, what are some of the big, you know, you and I, we talked about it briefly before, but some of like the big changes that you've seen with your owners or just managing the vessels in general during, uh, during this time, as well as going forward to the future? Yeah, the, the initial knee joke was that um, there would, the, the, the whole year's gone. Um, in the last two or three weeks, that theme has changed to, we're going we're gonna to have a, a summer we can use the boat. How are we going to do it? Um, I, I think from a, there's the, the uh, recommended responses, then there are the logical responses. In my opinion, as soon as we are, we are able to get uh, at home rapid tests, the way forward is going to be that the, uh, the day before, same day, guests are arriving, the crew have a rapid test and go on board the boat and the boat is essentially isolated at that point. Um, and ready to, to receive guests. I think it's logical for those guests to all have done a, a, a test to, for their own um, well-being. Go straight to the yacht, and then the yacht is a, essentially a bubble. What, what is in, interesting in the business, um, we have uh, 460 crew within the fleet. We don't have one case, confirmed case yet. Um, in uh, one of the uh, associations, I'm a member of, uh, there's a combined uh, group that has, represents about 6,000 crew. Uh, in that group, there are five confirmed cases of which most of those were crew that were at home, not on board the yacht. So the, the point here is that the onboard incidence level in the industry is minute. Uh, the concept being that once, uh, once you've created the bubble and you know that everybody is negative uh, and you're within that bubble, you're, you're probably in one of the safest environments on the planet right uh, and that we can maintain that safe environment for the entire voyage um then uh, at the end of the voyage the crew the, the uh, clients most of them i think uh, most of our clients um are comfortable uh, and uh, would prefer to go private um, an interesting spike is the amount of uh, private jet rent, uh, rentals has gone through the roof um, but the pricing is also extremely aggressive and, and um, actually surprisingly low. So uh, it's practical to, to use a private jet for the transportation of guests um, and get into the bubble. So that is, that's what we're working on right now. Um, I'd say the biggest challenge is the few boats that laid off some of the crew is bringing new crew in because mm -hmm. ideally we want to isolate those crew for two weeks before they join. So. Um, that's, and how that's, do you manage so with that too, Graham? So how do you manage as far as like outside vendors or or even Chris Coleman has another question just to summarize is like, 
dealing with uh, day workers and whether or not to bring day workers on, or do you see, yeah, to maintain that bubble? I, I think that's that that's what's so unique about the yachting industry right now is that it really is the it's a, the one holiday where you have full control of your environment. So it's Absolutely. like it's not on managing outside vendors. Do you guys have you implemented other forms of protocol to to uh, yeah to screen people coming in on and off? Yeah. The yeah. So each vessel has a single point of entry. Uh, where every individual should be, well, will be, is sanitized and checked. Uh, the day workers, that sort of work is, is pretty much come to a stop. Um, we, I, in the ideal environment, we put a hiring and firing freeze so the crew, all the crew are on board. And the jobs are allocated according to which can practically be done by crew and which can practically be done by vendors with no interaction with the crew. So, for example, doing a whole paint job it's probably a really good idea right now mm -hmm. where the, uh, you can isolate the crew and the, and the contractor uh, 100% uh, through that entire process. And that, that contractor is hungry for work, so you're going to get the best pricing that we've seen in 15 years. Um, so the, choosing the jobs, it, it really becomes the key piece. Um, but the crew, your crew are incredibly resourceful. Give them time and the right materials. They do... A phenomenal job uh, that um, ninety percent of the vendors would be envious of. Mm -hmm. Have you seen a big increase in work? You know, yard work uh, being done now. I mean, you know, this would be the sort of the optimal time to have a yard period uh, in preparation for the kind of everything opening back up. Have you seen that within your own fleet? Yes, uh, we've yeah you know, we've encouraged as I said um, bottom work on boats, uh, hull paint jobs. You know, if you take the, the average hull paint job is going to take six weeks. Traditionally, that six weeks was a harder thing to find than the finances to do the paint job. Uh, we have the great situation right now where we've got the time and we've got uh, the best rate that, as I said, we've seen in years. So yes, um, we're, uh, we're seeing uh, a lot of bottom work done on the boats. Um, if there's a trusted no-end vendor that can do things like uh, a large work on an engine, on, um, say an engine overall with minimal interaction from the crew, then we're also encouraging that. Um, mm -hmm. But in, in that scenario, it had to be a trusted vendor where the, the crew don't feel the need to supervise every single step that's taken. Yeah. What, what's your sort of outlook for the future of the, of the yachting industry, Graham? Even looking, at, we were discussing before with um, sort of outside, and it kind of led into talking about the passenger yacht code uh, certificate that you guys enabling 36 or much uh, more people on board for charter boat, but looking at like the Ritz Carlton with their cruise line or very high end yacht like cruise line coming out of Virgin. What's your outlook for uh, sort of the yachting industry as well? Well, I think if you take uh, what we saw two weeks ago, so ago, just on the smaller boat side, once they opened up marinas and, uh, and slipways, um, there was in some places a, a line of five miles long with people trying to get their boat in the water. So we know the appetite's there. Uh, for sure, I think from a practical point of view, there's no doubt that we can create a bubble on a liveaboard yacht. Um, and I don't think any other environment can boast that. So if you have a client that may be considering a high-end holiday at a, at a high-end resort, there's still interaction with people that you really don't know where they were 12 hours ago. Um, on the yacht, we can absolutely do that. Um, so I think Outlook is, is exciting. Um, as more cruising destinations become available. I think your end user is going to be a slightly different uh, end user. It's going to be somebody who's genuinely interested in yarding and being mm -hmm. on the water. Um, the, the ability to do what, um, what I'll call restaurant hopping, where the yachts is basically just a glorified transporter from restaurant to restaurant. The 2020 is not going to be the year for that type of end user. Um, but I do think that the... Uh, the, the smaller cruise ship model on high end is also going to enjoy a, a spike in business uh, where there's comfort that there's less people and it's a much more controlled environment. And I'm excited from a PYC point of view because I think that that's, uh, that environment of, say, 300 guests are our next charter clients. And as we know, our, most of our buyers chartered a yacht before they bought one. So we've added another, another layer to the pyramid of trying to get that that final yacht owner, and I, I see those um, those high end smaller cruise ships as a great recruiting ground for our next 
our next owners. Um, in, in my opinion, on the charter side, we're, we're probably missing about 97% of the market right now. We haven't even scratched the surface on, on what's available for charter. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think that, uh, that uh, as an industry, as long as we carry on the path we've been, that we're not having any incidences, we can create a bubble. Uh, people still want their downtime. They still want their leisure time. And I can't think of a better environment than, than getting on board a yacht. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's, I think that's a, it's a very controlled environment for sure. And I think like what we were talking about too with some of these higher end, larger, uh, larger cruise ships yeah, is, is being an intro, you know, an intro to sort of the yachting experience and being able to go to the smaller anchorages and so forth. Can you talk to a little bit so about your uh, the passenger yacht code? Yeah, the passenger yacht code was introduced um, in about 2003. We start to see this emergence of, of yachts over to 200 feet becoming somewhat common. And the, the final owner was going, you know, that's a little odd that um, I built this, this vessel uh, over a hundred million dollar investment in, in a yacht, but I can only have myself and, and 11 other people. Uh, when in truth, you know, there's, there's thousands and thousands of square feet of accommodation available. Um, that's where the idea was born of how do we get that we can practically put more people on board a vessel. Uh, there, are, there are thresholds and one of them is that 12 people um, uh, as constitutes a yacht. Anything over that um, becomes a passenger ship. So the, uh, the code was, was drawn, drawn up initially to allow up to 36 passengers on board yachts. The yacht itself is built very close to a solar standard, which is a shipping standard. And um, one of the easy ways to see if a yacht is to that standard, it's gonna, they're gonna have that big orange lifeboat built into the side of the vessel somewhere. Um, so that you had the hardware that, that meets solace. The next was to get the, the crew that could interact with that hardware and provide, provide a safe environment. Uh, and that's where the passenger yacht code and being certified comes into play that uh, we have crew, uh, uh, when you have 36 people on board, the way in which you would manage a emergency is vastly different to the way you'd manage 10 people. Mm. Uh, so there is, uh, it's, it's the crew's interaction with the vessel and the both the safety and the maintenance of the vessel uh, to keep it almost at solace levels. Um, it's, uh, it's an exciting area. Uh, right now, uh, we're, we're uh, certified to go up to 350 passengers, although that vessel doesn't exist. Um, it's, uh, it's an interesting area that I think that uh, logically, if you're gonna do that sort of the investment that we're seeing in, in the arts right now, uh, logical that, that you'd wanna have more than 11 other people, uh, mm -hmm. 12 including the beneficial owner. And then so, Graham, at, at what size, you know, at what size vessel does it become for an owner to have a conversation with Fairport and yourself kind of what sort of like the smallest boats that you start becoming involved where there's, can you kind of take us through that a little bit as well? We get calls as soon as a permanent crew member becomes involved in the, in the vessel, I think it's a good time for an owner to have a conversation about employment practices. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the, uh, and, and at least have the information to understand the best ways to employ a crew member and to, uh, to create a, a environment that's both fair and safe for the crew member, um, but also that's not uh, inadvertently gonna uh, uh, cross over into the total asset value of the owner. So you're limited to the value of the boat. Yeah, you limit your liability. I would say at about three crew, permanent crew, is a good time for an owner to start thinking about outsourcing um, the, the employment and the management of that, of that crew. Um, and that's, a, that's about where we get in. So at around 120 feet is where we, we start becoming involved in, in, uh, in the crew side of it. And regularly that, that leads through to, um, and certainly in this environment where we may just be doing the crew employment um, you know, I'm getting a lot of calls from clients saying, well, what do you know about where I can use my boat and you know, how mm -hmm. is COVID affecting us? So we get more into logistics uh, after that. So, yeah, it's like differentiating yourself from, say, just a full-time captain that would be handling logistics directly with the owner. 
is how, can you just elaborate a little bit on the differences that you offer versus what a captain would do as well? Uh, absolutely. You know, I called my company a, a support and service company because I don't believe that management is the right term. The, the captain is the manager on the boat, the, the vessel. There's no ways that my team sitting in an office thousands of miles away can really manage it any, any better than a captain can. So the, the, the captain manages the vessel they, and, as, and there has to be trust between the captain and the owner. And I certainly don't want to get in the middle of that relationship. Uh, where we help is, is resources to both teams. So um, the captain uh, should be focusing on, on the yacht and, and the, the owner's enjoyment. Um, they shouldn't have to worry about whether a new a crew member they've just hired from, say, New Zealand is subject to income tax or what, what is the right sort of uh, insur medical insurance. That, that's what my team should, should be doing for both owner and, and the captain. So uh, we, it's a team approach. Uh, Mm -hmm. we, we specialize in certain things and, and the captain specializes in others. But when you work it together, ideally, you come up with a solution that is the, the most cost-effective, cost efficient, and um, safest way for the owner. Yeah, no, that sounds great. Well, yeah, we really appreciate your, uh, your time here today, Graham. And how, how would an owner get in touch with you if they're interested in learning more about uh, yeah, vessel support or crew management? Uh, possibly through the website is a, is a good way because on that there's information on how we do our, our uh, services and a breakdown of each menu of services. Uh, uh, the uh, website address is www.fairportsupport.com. Um, uh, you can Google Fairport Yacht and we'll come up on any sort of search. Uh, on my, my mobile number is on that. Um, please feel free to reach out on my mobile. I'll give you my mobile now. It's also that uh, plus one for the United States, 954-980-0902. Yeah, and I think what's also really useful and helpful too is for someone that's interested, you know, for a potential buyer for a new boat as well as working with you is starting that conversation early to get a handle on, you know, costs associated, the operating costs and so forth with the boat. I know that we've discussed and you've talked to with some of our other guys as well, but that's a, a great resource for that as well. Well, thank you. And I, I'm, I'm happy to help the, um, yeah, I live in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, I've dedicated my whole life to this industry. All of my friends uh, are in the industry. Uh, I just want to see the, the industry do well and, and have a positive uh, interaction with, with our clients. Uh, I understand that 80% of the conversations I have don't need to business directly for Fairport. I'm happy to do it. I, as long as the client's getting off on the right foot and getting good information, uh, that's going to lead them to a good uh, experience and recommend yachting to the rest of their friends, then I've done my job. Yeah, well, thanks again, Graham, for, uh, for being here. And yeah, we'll uh, look forward to being in touch here in the future. Thank yeah. you. Thank, thank you very much for putting this together. Graham, that was absolutely fantastic, as expected. So thank you so much. Thank um, you. So much. Absolutely. You, you've just watched our, our seventh webinar in our ongoing series. And I do want to make the point that you can find all of our past episodes on our YouTube channel. And we really hope you check it out. Over the last couple months, we've had the, the opportunity to speak with experts about charter insurance, uh, the market for new builds in Europe, as well as a variety of other pertinent issues. Uh, as far as next time, uh, we're gonna be mixing it up. We're gonna be speaking with a yacht owner to get his thoughts about this unique moment in time, as well as just generally, what, what issues are top of mind for, for him. So no doubt that'll be a great conversation. It will take place at next Thursday at 10 a.m. And uh, we look forward to seeing you there. Thanks for joining us. Great. Thanks again, Graham. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.